For, um, for those of you who were able to hear Karen Ellis last fall, you know that you're in for a blessing today. Um, it, was, uh, it was so great to have her here last fall. Um, her message in the Wright Center and in Beeson's Chapel um, just blessed so many people. Uh, we really appreciated just how she interacted with others while she was here, and we are so glad that um, she was able to, to come back and join us today. We are, we're privileged to have her. Karen is the director of the Edmiston Center for the Study of the Bible and Ethnicity in Atlanta, Georgia. She's passionate about theology, human rights, and global freedom. I'm sorry, global religious freedom. Ms. Ellis is the Canada Fellow for World Christianity at Reformed Theological Seminary. She holds a Master of Art in Religion from Westminster Theological Seminary, a Master of Fine Art from the Yale School of Drama, and is a PhD candidate in the World Christianity and Ethics at the Oxford Center for Mission Studies in England. She's, um, she also collaborates with the Swiss-based organization International Christian Response, traveling internationally to connect local and global Christians while studying and advocating for global religious freedom. Her research explores Christian endurance from society's margins, uh, particularly in places where it's most difficult to live the Christian life. We're also grateful to have her husband here, Dr. Carl Ellis, uh, who, thank you, all right, uh, he serves at um, RTS as well as the Provost Professor of Theology and Culture, Assistant to the Chancellor, and Senior Fellow of the African American Leadership Initiative. Please welcome me in welcoming Ms. Karen Ellis back to Beeson Divinity School. Thank you so much. <laughs> my husband will continue to be the loudest person in the room. I call him my Hammond B3 organ because he's just right there on time. <laughs> amen. He's, he is his own, a, his own amen corner. Welcome. I am not going to assume that everyone in this room knows Jesus intimately, knows Jesus Christ. Some of y'all might have just come for the free lunch. I get that. I've been there. I've done it before myself. So welcome. Welcome to all. If you do not know Jesus Christ personally and intimately, you're about to hear a family conversation and you're welcome into it. So now you're going to be like, ooh, we're going to get some juicy gossip, some, uh, some dirty laundry. <laughs> no, we're just going to talk about history and God's hand in it and his glory and how we fit into the picture. At the Edmiston Center in Atlanta, we work with a number of paradigms uh, to help us understand and apply, because they go together, right? We'll talk about that in a little bit, to understand and apply scripture to Christian life on the margins of society. When I was here last October, um, together we charted a line of the House of Wisdom and the House of Folly through redemptive history. And we ask the question, whose house will you choose? You're gonna be wise unto life, or you're gonna be foolish unto destruction. And trust me, every single choice that you read about that people make in the Bible is a decision between one of those two poles. It's either wisdom unto life or foolishness unto destruction. So whose house will you choose was the question we were asking the last time. This time, today, I want to introduce a new paradigm that's loosely based on something we call narrative theology with a high view of scripture in mind, because not all narrative theology has a high view of scripture. But with it, I want to ask you a new question. And this one goes with your, whose house are you going to live in, wisdoms or folly? The question today is, Whose story are you following? Pull up your Bible and go with me to Revelation 21, verses 5 through 27. Here it comes, the word of the Lord. Revelation 21, 5 to 27. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with the rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 
144 cubits, according to human measurement, which it, the angel used. The building material of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first foundation is jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, and the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The main street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. I did not see a temple because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never close by day because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. It's the word of the Lord. Come on now. The book of life is mentioned at least eight times in the scriptures. Seven of those times are in the book of Revelation. Only one, only those who are written in the book of life will gain access to this place we just heard about and the future new earth and receive the right to be known in this world and in the next as the people of God. Some people call God's book of life a citizenship list for God's heaven and new earth. So who are these people that have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony? The book is a historical record of the people of God. Now, a wonderful pastor friend of mine used his sanctified imagination, and he wondered aloud if, since it was a glorified book for a glorified people, written and kept by a glorified Savior, what if it's more than just a list? What if each name was a chapter, a record of each of our lives, our interactions with others that reflected the work of Christ on earth, that made an impact on eternity and gathered more names and chapters into this glorified book of the people of God? Did you ever see the movie Crash? It's got a lot of language in it, so just, yeah. You know, if anybody questions you about it, don't tell them I told you to watch it. But if you watch the movie Crash, what's interesting about the movie, it's come from like the mid-2000s. What's interesting about it is there are main characters. You start the movie with main characters, and then all of a sudden, the lens of the camera shifts, and the characters that are sub-characters now became main characters, and the main characters now become sub-characters, but everybody is interacting with each other. Like in the store, main story here, somebody's stocking groceries here. Main story becomes sub-story. Person stocking groceries becomes the main story. Person walking by in the previous story is now small. But it shows how interwoven our lives are. There's a number of plays that do this too. If you know Shakespeare, um, or uh, the way that they took uh, Hamlet, and turned it around to a modern play called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have two lines, basically, roughly, in the whole Hamlet play. But in their story, Hamlet and Ophelia are tiny little characters, and they're just two spear-carrying guys like, man, what is going on in the castle in Denmark? And you get to see the story from their perspective. So what if the Lamb's Book of Life was all of our lives interwoven together? Let me ask you this. 
is your quiz. If you could sum up the grand redemptive theme of the whole Bible in one sentence, what would that sentence be? Anybody want to take a guess? One sentence. The whole team. <laughs> you want me to tell you? I will be your God and you will be my people. That is the whole promise of the whole entire Bible. And this is the theme of the ancient story. And you'll need to remember this. What's the theme of the story? I will be your God and you will be my people. So we begin. One common storyline unites the people of God through the entire span of redemptive history. God opens our story not with a once upon a time, but with a let there be at creation. All of the let there be's were set in order that builds toward one end, the flourishing of a man and a woman. And as he spoke their let their be's, whatever item was created by his speaking was created for the sustenance of the thing that came after it. So with each spoken word, each creative breath, our author and finisher, author and finisher of our faith, of the Lamb's Book of Life, is building, flourishing, building, flourishing. And after all their let their bees are done and the cows have their place and the grass has its place and the luminaries in the sky have their place, he moves into a different kind of agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not let there be anymore. Now he rolls up his sleeves yeah. and he says, let us. God, in three persons, fashions with his hands the first man and the first woman, the first people who are his, created to worship him and him alone. Adam, and then woman. She gets eyelashes. Okay. Everything is in place for Adam and the woman to flourish, and the implication of the promises lays the foundation for our story. I will be your God, and you will be my people. A promise that carries with it a story, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Aristotle taught us that. And right here at the beginning, the story takes shape right on cue, conflict. If the place is very good, God says it's very good. If the place is very good, all the things leading up to it are good. Man and woman now are in their place, and they're very good. What's that serpent doing there? <laughs> What's that serpent doing there? Remember this, very good is not yet perfect. Perfect comes at the eschaton. It's fixed. <laughs> Enter the serpent. Hi, pretty lady. How you doing? Listen, you know what I heard. And the first assault in the garden, not only against humanity in general, but in particular against the promised people of God. Adam and woman represent not only the first marriage, not just the first marriage, not just the first family. They are the beginning of God's people, the beginning of our story, a people he created for himself, a people intended to live in shalom, in the place he made for our flourishing, a place where our purpose was to serve as priests and kings. Our entire being was supposed to live, be lived in right relationship with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. But this goal wouldn't be achieved through us because of the garden assault. And we traded our wonderful birthright for the ability to worship not the one who made us, but to worship ourselves. Amen. Fall. And so God keeps his covenant promise, the theme of our story of the Lamb's Book of Life, through the entirety of recorded history, restating the promise of our destiny and our identity over and over and over again. I will be your God. You will be my people. He brings the promise of Genesis 15 to bear one significant day 
we just came off of Resurrection Sunday. Through the gift of the Son and Spirit, the triune God that rolled up his sleeves to make us accomplishes our reconciliation himself to himself and brings us back to shalom through a cruel cross, taking our place and doing what Adam couldn't accomplish for himself. And at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, came with a promise to take us to an even greater place than Eden. Remember, Eden, very good, but not perfect. Perfect is what we read at the beginning of this talk where the dwelling place of God is with men and women forever, unchangeable, uninterrupted, uncorruptible, forever. Redemption and glory. What a story. Ours is a story that is not only to be told, it's being lived. Why did he make us? He didn't need us. He was complete on his own. own. The old gospel preacher says, God is God all by himself. He don't need nobody else. Perhaps he just made us because he wanted us. And it all started in the garden with two people created to be God's own. So what does the next garden generation tell us about these people? Well, let's look at Cain and Abel, another paradigm we look at at, uh, at the Edmiston Center. The next generation tells us that the same question that was asked of the parents is now asked of the children, generation to generation, through the ages until our very own. Who will you worship? Whose story will you follow? Yours or God's? Who will be the arbiter of right and wrong, good and evil? You or God? Life or death? Wisdom or folly? Choose this day whom you will serve. And in no time, the whole thing escalates. Well, that escalated quickly. One generation after our parents in the garden, the argument over who and how we will worship intensifies. And it's not just a battle between two brothers. It was and still is a spiritual battle. Adam and woman's kids, the religion of Cain, versus the worship of Abel, the worship of self versus the right worship of God. And this is the major and basic pattern of the world today. The difference is only how it gets carried out. But God. We see his covenant promise echoing throughout Scripture that he would keep a people to himself, he would keep that people's history. He would know our deeds. You hear these echoes all over scripture that not even those people themselves could destroy our bond with him because he would swear by himself to keep it. And so he restates the promise of creation in Genesis 3.15, telling the man and the woman he would come and do what Adam didn't do in the garden. He would stomp that thing's head and it would come at great cost to himself. I will be your God and you will be my people. He restates it over and over and over again. And yet here we are looking at the sweet by and by and living in the nasty now and now while he works it out. Between the reality, between creation and glory, this part of the story is still very broken and it's very real and it's all around us and we've got work to do. In our brokenness, there are many voices distorting the story, telling us who the people of God are, but they aren't, usually defined by limited earthly terms, defined solely by gender, defined solely by ethnicity, defined solely by one's political performance, defined solely by one's conformity to culture, hundreds of years of surely the chosen ones must be me and my my people, my tribe. 
The way the story of the world is, is that the world wants to be God. The way of the story of the world is to demand that you be like me, like my people, rather than like him and his people. And no one can be me as well as I can be me. So what am I asking you to do? I'm making myself into God. And when I make myself into God and expect you to be me, you will always fail. From Genesis through the New Testament, history is riddled with men and women who remade God in their own image and then demanded that others bow the knee to them. They said to the world around them, I am now your God and you will be my subjects. In the hands of man, the blessing of the promise became a threat. The blessing became a burden. The blessing became a weight because the blessing was made only for God to wield. And so in the hands of humankind, the story gets altered. We look at our broken governments and we still see the serpent's havoc in this earthly realm. We look at our broken systems that man has created, exploiting and destroying the vulnerable around us. We look at our tribal disputes over land and wealth and power, and we see disease and hunger and poverty ravaging bodies, and we look around for somebody to blame. There's gotta be somebody around here I can blame for this. And there he is, slithering away from us with the juice of the rotten fruit he sold us, staining our hands with the blood of humanity. As saints of the story, we know that the world is not as it should be. This is not what God intended. We weren't made for this world. And God calls those in his story across the sweep of redemptive history as we anticipate the sweet by and by, we are all too aware that there are minefields to negotiate in the nasty now and now. Walk outside that door and look at the saints who navigated the minefields of humanity and did it well. Because the Lord declares and testifies of himself, I, the Lord, love justice. We know that the pursuit of just communities and societies is a noble and biblical cause. Yet even as we pursue justice for the least of these on society's margins, we realize that our governments, our cultural influencers, our politicians, many who have the platform of power because of the burden of the sin of Adam, bend the moral arc of the universe not toward justice, but toward self. And in doing so, they make themselves the gods of this cultural moment. So what does it mean then to be a people of a different story from the rest of the world, that people can look at communities individuals and say, oh, they're different. The story is about God in the Lamb's Book of Life, not us. God impacting us, God working through us, God allowing us to be part of his story and part of his process. And there are many lessons for us to learn from our unique story, a story of God-imbued perseverance, a story of God-imbued faithfulness, a story of God-imbued change. Because he don't leave any of us like he found us. The major theme of our story is, I will and well done. You don't sound sure, but that's, you're getting better. 
Christ is the hero of our story, lived as creator. Our four chapters, creation, fall, redemption, and glory. How do we live our unique story? Well, we talk, I think we might have talked about this last time I was here. Our epistemology and our ethics, what we know about God and how we obey God have to match. Ethics and epistemology must match. They're like two sides of a zipper. We teach our children this in, in the shorter catechism and people who catechize their kids. What do the scriptures principally teach? Answer, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Two sides of a zipper. Next time you zip up your jacket, be like, this is my ethics, this is my epistemology. <laughs> The story is the pole. Yes. Yes, the story is what binds them together. Uh -huh. The old people used to say, say ought to match do. Uh -huh. And the story of the people of God is the pull that brings them together. When the zipper is pulled, when we live the story from our hearts that we know so well in our heads, it has the power to radically upset the status quo. The story has a stealthy movement that is not apolitical. It's other political. It's not anti-cultural. Other cultural. <laughs> he knows my syllabus. <laughs> and it's a politics based on the life, death, resurrection, and glorification of Jesus Christ not on earthly power. On the surface, because there's death and suffering involved, it seems like it's powerless and weak. But it actually has the power to pull down dehumanizing strongholds, to change not just local communities and cultures, but sometimes entire governments. And while God can use anyone and anything Popularity, praise, and power are too often counterfeit currencies in this world. Becoming comfortable with anonymity is difficult for us all. Yet the God of the story, the creator of the universe himself, chose to dwell in a limited physical body instead of the vastness of the cosmos. Chose to do battle on a shameful, blood-stained cross to break powers and principalities that held his people captive. The kingdom of God doesn't come with careful branding. It doesn't come with our public proclamations, our news articles, our powerful speeches, our Twitter debates our cultivated social media engagement, or our strategic movement shaping. Now, those things have their place, and God's going to judge how we used those things. But God's kingdom is far more likely to come from among the unpopular, unlikely, unknown, and unheard, from among people who are engaged in the daily grind and who are faithfully bringing light to the shadows, just as Christ came to this burdened, darkened world. It has been coming throughout history from a people who have been so ignored by the history books of men that God had to write their stories down in the Lamb's Book of Life because he said, I will remember and I see. The names of ordinary people mark the book of Acts far more impressively than the kings and the rulers. The kingdom surprises us with its quiet intrusion. The coming of the kingdom on earth is not forceful or coercive, but rather it spreads in small and surprising places. It is always run underground beneath the noise of talking heads. A beginning, a middle, and an end. How does our story end? After this, I looked, 
And before me there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Revelation 7, 9. Maybe the Lamb's book is in a language we don't even understand today. But when we see him face to face, we'll know. Nation, tongue, tribe as aspects of the promise are also informative, I think, as keys of expression of the story, the way in which the story intrudes into this realm from the one that is to come, just like Jesus' incarnation. These categories are mentioned as God gathers us to his throne. That matters. Nations, tribes, tongues. Why not just people? Here are some thoughts. Nation. The context where broken systems tend to oppress humanity. Each context is different, yet it's bound together by one overarching story. And the story bears the heavy freight and weight of each of our cultural contexts. And it also unifies and binds us together in our goals toward expanding the people of God, even as the places where we work and learn and serve look so very different. When the story hangs together, it can handle the differences of our individual context. And we find that though the expressions of community may be different, the covenantal story is still the same. This is how we can come to a, a classroom like this and talk with each other and hear common threads if we know him, because we're all following the same story. Tongues. The ability to tell the story in the heart language of the people that we love. In my research, uh, I've learned that there's an absence of music and worshipful art that tells the covenantal story in lesser known languages and depictions of non-Western presence in the story. It's not that it isn't in there, but it could be so much more. And tribe. This is the place of healing of the broken personal relationships that are closest to us. The story has a fluid time-space quality about it. As we live as saints of the story, we cause intrusions of the coming glory and revelation of revelation into this dark world. And we see God manifesting himself in the Old Testament, just to be near his people, the theophanies where he draws near, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, intrusions of the kingdom of God and a brief glimpse of his glory divine. So as we live our matching ethics and epistemology, Such saints of the story, as you'll see when you walk out into uh, the, the global global voices uh, uh, wing, you want to call it a wing? Okay, into the center. Those saints living in alternative witness, this other cultural reality, these folks are peppered throughout history. These are our ancestors. Just as much as the people in the Bible are our spiritual ancestors. And we look at their work across history. And while I am all for honest tellings of history and learning from the failings of the church, I am persuaded that it will give us more life and more of the story. We look at the places where the saints walked more closely to the story than those who distorted it and abandoned it altogether. Learn the good stories. The story practices a different kind of culture and a different kind of politics from all cultures surrounding it. In a broken world where literal death, decay, and destruction rule, bringing both physical life, because the shalom of the garden was tangible, bringing physical life and earthly flourishing, far as the curse is found, is one of the most subversive, politically, 
culturally rebellious acts one can perform when done with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's an act in which the story, the people of the story have always engaged and ordered life in a chaotic world, a whole life in a broken world, a life of shalom, peace and wholeness with God, the way it was intended in the broken world. This is my story. This is my song, the song says, praising my Savior all the day long. We were literally in created, literally, to inhabit this covenantal story. And the story is what sets us apart. Resisting the spirit of the age is vital to maintaining the story. Little children, we read in 1 John, keep yourselves from idols. How easy it is for us to all be eights rather than saints. I've been there. <laughs> but God keeps us on track. Politics, important but not ultimate. Culture, important but not ultimate. Ethnicity, important but not ultimate. History, social movements, important but not ultimate. Christ and kingdom, ultimate. And our identity, our story, the story we follow will determine our priorities. Kingdom priorities provide an alternative witness that changes first individuals. Individuals change families. Families change communities. And sometimes nations. Sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. But it changes the shape of eternity as people are added. And since glory is indeed a people's place. God is still making a people for himself. Whew. You know, anybody, anybody can be a philanthropist. Anybody can do justice work. Anybody can do social work. But only the people of God can do these works and hold forth the transformational gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that hungers and thirsts for the ultimate philanthropy of the forgiveness of sins, the ultimate justice that satisfies the wrath of God that should have been poured out on sinners, but was instead poured out on God's Son. Only the people of God can do ultimate social work that builds the community of the people of God, oftentimes at great cost to the saints, to create a people who make up the chapters of the Lamb's Book of Life, which I'm sure will be a page turner and will take us all of eternity to read and understand in its rich fullness. Your story in the Lamb's Book of Life is no less than the story you've been actively living all week and the story to which you'll return in your ultimate Sabbath rest. Creation, fall, Redemption, glory. I will be your God. You will be my people. Let's return to the promise of the book as we close. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and its lamp is the lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never close by day because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Amen.